if you went to sleep today and you woke up in the morning in a virtual world. Let me give you an idea of the experience you will have in that virtual world. You will be able to see 7.2 million colors quite easily. You will hear sound in very high definition. All 20,000 tones that your ear can pick, you will hear them. If you were wearing a haptic glove, you will be able to feel the corners in this world. But one thing that would immediately become apparent to you in this world is this. You will smell nothing, and you will taste nothing. So it turns out, the matrix, they were right. The machines didn't get the taste of chicken correctly. Then it becomes a question, why would that kind of a world exist? It's actually quite straightforward. As a civilization, we have succeeded in digitizing touch. Your mobile phones that you're using right now takes the sensory products from your hand and it puts it in the digital domain. Vision, we have digitized. We have the cameras and we have the screens you can see in front of me. And sound, there's a huge music industry that is worth several trillion dollars that is built on sound. So, let's get a little bit into the science of how this works. The reason why touch is simple is because it's a two-dimensional sense. It's either the touch is there or it is not. You generate about 40, a little bit over 40 newtons of force that a human being can generate with their touch. The sound, as we learned from the earlier speaker, the sound is an energy wave. It's a compression and rarefaction of air. And vision, for all the 7.2 million colors that you could see, only three cells, again, only three kind of cells, three color cells in your eye, are able to determine or combine in different ways to give you a sense of vision. However, when it comes to smell and taste, that's a much, much complicated business for two reasons. One, when it comes to smell, you have 400 different protein receptors so 400 different basis states. Again, 400 different basis states in comparison to what you get from vision, which is three. So the smell is a much more complicated business. So it's a very hard problem. Second, in this room, there are probably hundreds of smells, maybe even thousands of smells in this room but they don't generate any energy. The particles of smell, they are just bobbing about in space. They don't impart any energy, so it makes it very difficult for electronics to detect it. However, smell is a problem that biology, evolution, has spent the last 600 million years perfecting. You see the humble dog you're looking at on the screen? Anecdotally, this dog, if you have a football field and you put a rose on one corner of the football field and you have the dog on the other side, it will tell you that there's a rose on the other side. That's how good the sense of smell is. Yes? In fact, if you own a dog and you leave a room and the dog comes into that room, it can tell that you were in that room. That's how good the sense of smell of the dog is. So, it begs the question, how is it possible that a problem that biology has solved so elegantly still evades us a technologically advanced species? Let's get into the science a little bit, just a little bit, of how that works. You see, 
The first step in per perceiving smell is that you have the smell particles everywhere in the air. Here is a cutout of the dog's nose. The dog's nose serves two functions. One function, it collects the air, the air goes inside, yeah? And it goes to the lungs and it keeps the dog alive, yeah? The second part is what is interesting for us. The, the air goes on the back of the nose of the dog to something you call the olfactory epithelium. It, by the way, the human nose works in a similar way, yeah? So, when the particles of smell, when they go into the nose of the dog, so this is the cutout of the nose of the dog, when the particles go into the nose of the dog, they bind to these neurons, yes, there's neurons, yes, that are in the nose of the dog, these particles, they bind to it. And what happens is these cells, these neurons, they will generate a tiny bit of electrical signal. And this tiny bit of electrical signal goes to the brain of the dog, and the dog is able to say, I am smelling bacon, I am smelling explosive, or I am smelling my owner, depending on what it's smelling, right? And the active thing here is this protein is called an OR, or a, G, a class of G uh, protein coupled receptor. It's a protein, okay? So, my name is Osh Gabi. I'm the founder and CEO of Koniku. We are a company based in Silicon Valley, and we build cyborgs. What does this mean? We are building a new class of technology that takes biological tissue and merges it with silicon. So you have machines that have one part of it is biology and the other part of it is silicon. How do we do this? We take uh, DNA sequences. So a DNA is a code of life. Everyone, everyone here has a copy of this DNA in their person that determines who they are, from your behavior to what your face looks like, what your skin color is, and so on and so forth, eye, hair, and so on. We figured out a way to take DNA, stick it into biological neurons, and get these neurons to produce whatever kind of receptors that we are interested in. Let me show you an example of uh, the technology at work. So in this image that you're looking at here, on the top left-hand side, you see a timer. On the left picture, you have cells that have been genetically engineered that every time they come across an explosive particle, they light up. They light up because we have put a jellyfish genome inside of the cells. So when the TATP here, when the compound here flashes, you will see that the cells will light up, right? So the TATP is not showing, but the, the chemical compound, we give it to the cells, and the cells will produce a burst of light, right? So this is what the chip looks like. It's a tiny chip. You can compare it with the size of a uh, US cent. It's a tiny chip. And just like in the dog's nose, we have designed this chip that we can pull in the air from outside using a micro pump. We pull in the air from outside, yes? And the air goes under, and it gets into contact with genetically modified biological cells. And we have electronics and optics on the back end that are able to collect the light from these cells, and they can transmit this light or this signal everywhere. By so doing, we have combined over 600 million years of evolution. In man's hand, we have combined it with the technology. So, we start from the raw, the raw materials of nature. We have a library of the elephant, the human, the mouse, the dog, uh, the drosophila, and the mosquito, right? And we've built a platform on the back end that allows us to essentially check across all, the, all these different animals, and we'll continue to add more to it, and we can detect, and we can create uh, whatever kind of protein that is interesting for us. Additionally, we don't just stop there. We also take the, compound, uh, the receptors that are existing in nature, and we change the characteristics, and we make it even better, so we mutate them and make them better than what exists in nature. Our company's declared mission is to map all the smells that touch human life. 
Whether it's the smell in an airport or the smell that is coming from your breath or the smell in an industrial case, we map all of it to uh, detect uh, smell. Uh, this is not uh, something that is in the lab. This is something we are uh, pushing out in the real world and deploying already today. So one of our biggest customers is Airbus, the aircraft manufacturer. Whenever you're traveling somewhere, you go to the airport, you have to take out your bag, take out all your belongings, and people will search you, and so on and so forth. With this technology, we are looking at the future where you can walk from the curbside to the aircraft in a completely seamless way, because the, the technology is such a small form factor. So here is uh, a, a demo of the technology in action. So here you have a pretend airport desk. And at the back of this airport desk, you have our technology. You don't see it. But you come with your bag to the airport, and you're checking in, and you put your bag there. And this bag is laced with tiny amounts, very tiny amounts of explosive. And we are sampling it live. We are collecting the air from the bag and from the environment. And here, you can see the plot. Right? And automatically, we can send this signal you can send it to the control center and it can tell that somebody is carrying an explosive. Okay? Hey, Additionally, guys, because of the small form factor, we are about to watch the first time. We built a dog. A dog, a robot dog. It's a living dog. This is the, this is, this dog so, is alive. So, so my team uh, built this thing in like a month. You see here? So you see the technology in the back there? Right? And, and you see the nose drills where it pulls in the air from the outside. Whatever is in this. And what is, is in, in here is a drug, is an illegal drug, but in very, very tiny amounts. So we put it on the back of the dog and it's able to smell it. So every time the dog makes like that, this uh, robot dog or this cyborg dog does this, it's sending a signal from here, it's sending it automatically uh, to a phone. Right? So you can send it anywhere you want. And you will see uh, one of our engineers is going to come over and he's going to show a mobile phone of this uh, very effect that we can detect. Yeah, he's going to show that in a second. So you can notice the so distance, cool. the distance that exists that between. That is so cool. Look at that. So you see Look the same that. traces. This is so cool. You see the same traces of uh, being able to do that detection. So that's the, that's the, the lab model. So I charged my team uh, to take this thing, put it on the dog, and they were able to essentially build up the system in a month. And of course, uh, there is the more, hey, this is the version guys, that, is now shipping, that is now shipping in some countries. Okay? So we've genetically engineered cells. We've built a chip that allows you to put this, chip, uh, this technology on a machine. We've demonstrated it in the lab. So we decided to take it to the field and do a competition head-to-head -head with the dog, with the actual dog. Out of 114 trials with the FBI and the mobile police in Alabama, how do you think we did? How do you think the performance was? The Conicor versus the dog. We were able, out of 114 trials, the dog was detecting at a 54% accuracy. 54, 58% accuracy. Out of 114 trials, we did not miss a single false positive or a single false negative using our technology stack. And this is a double-blind experiment, or this is a, a double-blind deployment, by the way. Of course, we do not stop at explosive detection. We also demonstrate that we're able to detect things like amphetamine, cannabis, methadone, fentanyl, and other illegal drugs. So the security sector or the safety sector is very interesting, or drug uh, detection is interesting. By far, one of the most interesting applications for us is this idea that we can diagnose disease in real time. Everyone in this room, at every, with every breath you take, you're breathing out anywhere from 1,000 different compounds to up to 3,000 different smells that are coming from your breath. And all of these smells, they are given an indication of your state of health. There is an initiative from the Canadian government called the Human Metabolome Database that determined that in the human body, there are up to 100, more than 100,000 different metabolites. 
we want to be able to map all of these metabolites and be able to make a statement about your state of health. So, to think from first principles, why do you go to the hospital? If it's not an emergency, like a trauma, why do you go to the hospital? You go to the hospital because you will be connected to a lot of equipment that will collect data that is called biomarkers so that they can make a statement about your state of health. And once all of these equipments are connected to you and you collect all of this data, the doctor comes with their training and the doctor is able to make spot patterns and make re recommendations to you. So, what if you didn't have to go to the hospital at all? What if you had a technology in your house that is able to map all the biomarkers in your body in real time? So, um, we have done clinical trials where we demonstrated that we can detect COVID from breath. We've done the first phase of that clinical trial. And for us, it doesn't just stop at breath. It's, it goes all the way to being able to analyze saliva samples, urine samples, sweat samples. In fact, our goal by the end of this decade is to have this technology in 10 million homes in the United States uh, for diagnosing disease in real time. We want to turn the home into a healthcare, uh, the bathroom into a healthcare data center. We have demonstrated that we can detect the VOCs that are related to influenza A, that we can detect all the VOCs that are produced when you catch influenza A. We have also demonstrated that we can detect stress levels from urine samples. Um, so before I show this video, uh, it's cool to, to do all of this in the lab and show all of this is working. Uh, let's deploy in the industry. Let's deploy in a real airport and see what that looks like. So I'm going to play this video. Uh, this is a deployment of our technology at a major airport in the United States of America, the first airport we deployed to. And over this year, we'll be deploying to more. This is the security advisory. Please maintain possession of your bags at all times. Please report any suspicious activity or unintended items. What we have built at Conico is a smell cyborg that allows us to read the air and smell what is in the air. We have demonstrated here today that we can detect explosives in a completely seamless way. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to touch anything. Your bags are automatically screened. We're doing a scenario of a check-in counter. It's installed. We may have a big screen on the side or something. Previous tests have done it in labs or in a warehouse testing, but in, in an airport testing, you're getting more of the air contaminants, right? This is all done by the sniffing of the air particles. And in an airport, you've got jet fuel, you've got people with different colognes, perfumes. We have gone ahead and borrowed directly or taken the technology that biology has used to smell and put that on a chip. Hence the cyborg. We have taken living biological neurons, we've genetically modified them to carry these proteins and stick them on a chip and manage to keep those cells alive for prolonged periods of time. So the biology now is acting as a sensor device, it's acting as a computational unit, and it's acting as a reporting unit. And the electronics surrounding it is doing further processing on it and helping us transmit that signal everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it really depends like where you... It was a bit emotional. This is exactly what we were waiting for, I mean. And when we all saw the, the curves and the signal popping, uh, yeah, we were like, okay, we've done it. The beauty of the technology is that you can actually uh, reprogram the cells to detect one uh, compounds or another. Today we are working with explosive, but we know that the technology is already able to detect other types of uh, chemical compound, and that's what makes this uh, technology uh, so beautiful and versatile. It's a multi-solution technology. So you are screening explosives, you are screening breath and diagnosing disease in real time on a single device. In the case of COVID-19, we just completed the first phase of our clinical trials 
And now we're moving to the second phase. One of the things that COVID has taught us is that now we have merged the issue of security and safety into one singular issue. So a person that is carrying the virus is as dangerous as a person that is carrying explosives on themselves. So we can also screen for that. There are multiple ways we can use that technology, either at the check-in desk, at the revolving doors, at the stairways, at the lift, even at the security screen line. It could be installed in bathrooms, anywhere in the current lobby area, and it provides assurance to safer passenger travel. There is no equivalent, there is no, no existing or competing technology that enables to scan constantly for explosive and chemical threat in large areas, in real time, for a low cost, etc. All this delivering data we could not access before. It provides this complete, horizontally integrated workflow that allows you to travel from the curbside to the aircraft in a, in a seamless way. Okay, um, so that's the deployment of the technology in the, in the airport space. But um, as this is a congress about the future. What we're building at Koniku is a fundamental shift. Uh, we're building a new kind of chip, a wetware, if you will. My motivation for starting this company was um, or one of my motivations was to push the boundaries of what's possible. Um, I did my PhD in uh, neuroelectronic interfacing. So we took biological uh, neurons, uh, we stuck them on a CMOS chip, and we used these biological neurons to do computations. Uh, we were able to transfer signals into these cells and get them to do addition of some numbers and so on and so forth. It was very funny. It, it didn't have a lot of uh, practical uses at the time. Um, 70, 75 percent of the people that work at Koniku today, they are PhD students, and I encourage them always to push the boundaries of what's possible. Being that we have neurons on chip, we ask ourselves, what is that one more thing we could do? So we decided to do some math. I know how uh, much silicon AI is very popular these days. So we made a calculation in terms of if you look at a square cube area of what is in silicon, the computation that is possible there, and you look at a square, uh, a square centimeter area with uh, silicon versus uh, biology, how do these two technologies compare? And you find that one advantage that biology has is that it has this so-called high density of computation. But right now, there is not really a functional use for it. Uh, but I, I suspect over the coming years, uh, Art Koniku will get more and more better at designing or building the brain from the ground up that is not just detecting smell. It's actually doing the calculations on the biological side before it sends that signal, uh, before it sends that signal outside. Um, to do that, you need two things. To build a chip that is wetware and is intelligent as wetware, you need two things. Number one, you need structure, meaning can you put these biological neurons on the chip? Can you direct where they grow? Can you build interesting circuits out of this? We demonstrate that we can do that. So we can build a junction that has three populations of cells, so population one, population two, population three, and these three populations can connect in an interesting way. So we can define a nice architecture for this biological system. So that's first, neural structure. This neural structure, can we do it in three dimensions? Yes, can we design this three-dimensional uh, unit? This is R&D coming from our company, by the way. And here we show, so this is a, this is a, a two-photon image. It's a, it's, a, it's a microscopic image, right? And what the camera is doing is going from the, on the z-axis, it's going from top to the ground, top to the ground. And here you see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cores. Yes? Nine different cores that are supporting a defined population of cells, and they are able to connect with each other. Okay? So we have defined an architecture, and we can make this architecture, we can make them communicate with each other. So one, we have done neural structure, and now what about neural function? And this is where the fun really begins. Yes? 
Can you design these neurons and can you make them talk to each other and can you make them learn something? Can you take a disembodied cells, disembodied neurons, can you take them out, put them on a chip and teach them to do something? Right? And there is this concept in biology that says neurons that fire together wire together. That means the more two neurons talk to each other, the more they form a strong connection. Can we demonstrate that this is not just happening inside a brain? Can we demonstrate that with our technology or without wet wear, uh, can we do this, yeah? And we show that we can do this. Yes? We show that here there are two populations of cells. There's one population here, there's one population here. And we deliver a stimulus to the blue population, right? And we are able to get the red population to unlearn. Yes? And in this case, we are able to get the blue population to learn. It's very primitive, it's very simple, right? But there are two key things I want to point out here. First, as a company, we exist to deliver value, to make people's lives better. I know I come from Silicon Valley, and these days this is not an interesting thing for people to hear, but it is true. We, start, we aim to, from the healthcare perspective, help people get access to better healthcare. There is no way we can make doctors fast enough to take care of nine billion people that are coming on this planet. We have to learn to do more with less. That's where the healthcare use case comes in, right? But what comes after that is the idea that we can now begin to build the brain from the ground up. Of course, we are always hiring. If you fancy living in California, feel free to reach out to us and join us on the revolution to build a new white way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chile. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.